All right. Well, welcome to another episode of the BioAg Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Johan Buck, Director of Technical Services with BioAg, and joining me are my awesome co-host, Bill Riddle and Josh Hedberg. Bill, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. Um, yes, good to see you. I am the ag guy in the room, so just a little background there. Josh? Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm uh, Josh Hedberg. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, indoor uh, hobby garden and uh, cannabis guy. Hey, right on. And joining us today, uh, really excited to have this guest on. First encountered Dr. James White from Rutgers on a uh, webinar with uh, the folks over at uh, Microbiometer. And Dr. White is a professor at Rutgers, and he is in the Department of Plant Biology, a microbiologist. And he was using this word that I had not heard of before, and I learned a tremendous amount. It, I was really taken aback. I just really got me fired up the research that he was doing. So once we initiated this podcast, I said to myself, we've, we've got to get Dr. White on, onto the podcast. He used this, this word called rhizophagy. It's just so much fun to say. And, and it's really neat. And it's an exciting area of, of plant biology and microbiology research. So Dr. White, James, welcome to our podcast. I'm glad we worked through the uh, technical issues that we had this morning and, and here we go. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you guys decided to ask me to do this podcast. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, uh, I didn't make up that word rhizophagy. Someone else invented that word and discovered the process. So, I mean, I, we've just been studying it for the past several years. 10 years or so, 10, 12 years or so. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to be here. Do well, let's, you, let's, yeah, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Before we get to where, the, well, let's, no, let's go ahead. Since you, since you mentioned that, where does that word come from? And then we'll get into what it means and, and how it relates to your research. Yeah. Yeah. So that word comes from a, a, a group that discovered the process actually in, Queensland, Australia, working at the university there, uh, they discovered uh, that uh, plants were internalizing microbes, yeasts and bacteria, mostly bacteria, uh, into the root, into the root cells, and you could visualize them in the root hairs. And, uh, and then they, actually that was in 2010, and then they named that in a chapter, a book chapter that they published uh, a couple of years later, uh, they named it rhizophagy, rhizophagy, which means rhizo referring to root, phagy referring to eating or root eating or basically plants that eat microbes in their roots, that consume microbes into their roots and then degrade those microbes and extract nutrients from those microbes. So it is basically a process, an undiscovered process, or I mean, it was discovered in 2010, uh, uh, whereby plants are getting nutrients by degrading uh, and extracting nutrients from microbes that they take into their roots. And uh, uh, they actually get the nutrients oxidatively from the, from the, from the microbes. That is, they, put, uh, they, they create reactive oxygen in their root cells and then they put that reactive oxygen. Superoxide is one of those highly potent form of reactive oxygen. They put that onto the bacteria, and that actually will extract nutrients from the microbes that are inside those cells. So this is something, you know, I think the big reason that people have hadn't no, haven't noticed it up until that point is um, really that you know we have our concepts with uh, how plants work and. Uh, to take microbes into the plant cells is not something that people uh, have thought has have thought was possible, except in some cases where there's pathogenicity, you know. So so people didn't see it. You know, I mean, I've seen lots of old papers where uh, they show uh, uh, microbes on root hairs, and you can see the microbes in the root hairs in the pictures, 
but they never saw it. The authors of the paper of the articles never actually saw it. So people have been looking at microbes in root cells for 100, over 100 years, and they never realized what they were. It's a, it's, this is something that was just totally missed by uh, scientists until very recently. Yeah, you said within the last 12 years? Yeah. Yeah, what the, the the statement that was that really captured my attention. You said it early on in that video was by the end of this, I want to convince you that plants harvest microbes like we harvest food. Yeah, right. I mean, basically, this is uh, an unknown nutritional process, or you know, was unknown a nutritional process that all plants are doing, uh, and uh, the. Very likely, you know, it's one of the primary functions of roots, actually, is to manage these microbes in the soil, to farm or to uh, to process, attract microbes first to the roots and then internalize them and get nutrients from them. So it's a it's a very common process. You know, we've been we've been considering um, that most of the nutrients that plants are getting, they're getting predominantly from solubilized nutrients. Right. That's what part of our chemical paradigm that they're that plants have roots and so those roots are extracting nutrients out of out of nutrients that are in soil water right but uh, this process is completely different and it it provides another avenue that is rhizophagy provides another avenue for nutritional uh, accumulation in plants from soils and it's it's more it's actually not a passive process like solubilized nutrients are which just the idea is plants just wait around uh, to absorb nutrients out of the soil you know so we have to squirt our chemicals in there so they can get it right i mean that's the idea that's but that's that is a notion that plants are passive and just waiting for us uh, to give them food uh, but uh, in rhizophagy you know it does demand that soils are healthy that they have good microbial mixture and that uh, plants then, what plants then will do is they will uh, attract the microbes to come to the roots by secreting exudates. And they'll secrete sugars, sugars, and sometimes amino acids and organic acids. Uh, they'll secrete those from the root tips. And then the bacteria in the soil, many of those are, are, uh, are mobile, motile they'll have ways to swim through the soil. And so they can, these microbes can detect the nutrients that are being secreted from roots, from the tips of roots, actually. And then they will swim using their flagella that they will swim through to those, to the root tips, to the highest concentration of the nutrients. And then what happens then once they go to the root tip, the, the plant will take them into the cells is absorbed them into those cells and uh and then what we what happens once they're absorbed in is the plant will begin to ex to put superoxide the reactive oxygen onto the microbes which starts to the process of extracting nutrients from those microbes and i do i do have some images that i could show if uh, you know if they're if we're going to be able to work that out uh, yeah, I think we can try to do that. We've, we've not done that yet, okay. but we're, let's try through it. So for okay. for those of the for, for listeners that are listening to this episode audio only, there is a video of the of every podcast as well. That's on our BioAg YouTube channel. So we've not we've not tried this hybrid. Uh, we use Zencaster is is our our medium. For recording, but we also have Zoom brought up because Zencaster doesn't have a screen share option. Zencaster, that's a cue for you to get screen share option. So we're going to try the Zoom as well, and hopefully we'll be able to to splice those together on our video only. But we're going to bring up the video, and Dr. White's going to show us some slides. We'll describe what it is we're seeing for you audio only listeners. But hopefully, we'll have the video portion available for you to view as well. So yeah, go right ahead, James. Okay, so so what we've been doing in in the laboratory is we've been trying to figure out uh, how plants are getting nutrients from these microbes, and we've been you know how are they managing these microbes in general. So I'll I'll just put some high points here, so you, you don't. I have a lot of slides here. I won't talk about all of them. Maybe I will, but very fast. <laughs> uh, 
So we're looking at mechanisms for nutrient extraction from endophytic microbes. And uh, I mean, biostimulant, you could say that these microbes are biostimulant, but typically biostimulant microbes are those you add in. And it turns out a lot of these biostimulant microbes also go into the rhizophagy cycle. So they function in the cycle, some better than others, but uh, they do tend to, to go in. Uh, so all plants actually will will have will take microbes into their tissues into their structure, and you can really see it in the in the root hairs. And this is a this is just a desert plant, a big cactus that we worked on some years ago. But this is just an example it's from a I, island of Bonaire in the Dutch Antilles. But it's a desert island that has these cacti all over. You can see fruits there. But if you look at the seeds there and the seedlings that come from that, you'll see a seedling, this little cactus seedling here. And you can see below, you can see the root hairs. Turns out the microbes go into those root hairs. And you can see the hairs here and you see all those little dots in there. Those are all the bacteria. If we didn't stain this, you wouldn't see the bacteria there. And that's one reason that some people weren't able to visualize these microbes before. Is they didn't realize they're microbes because you don't stain them. They're white and uh, they're, they're uh, just these little spherical structures uh, inside roots. This happens to be a reactive oxygen stain. And this is uh, for hydrogen peroxide, something called DAB up there that stains hydrogen peroxide brown. And hydrogen peroxide is around all of these bacteria because the plant is secreting uh, reactive oxygen onto these microbes. You can see here. Can these I ask arrows. you a question? Yeah, I'm going to interject you there bet. for a moment, James. You you Could bet. you help yeah. those? Yeah. Because our listeners are quite eclectic. Um, we could you pause and, and briefly explain to us reactive oxygen species or ROS. Typically, yeah. I think we hear ROS. Yeah. We're thinking oxidants. We're thinking stress, right? So help help us understand those a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, no, that's a good that's a good thing. Okay, so reactive oxygen species. That's ROS, right? I mean, you yep. are familiar with stress and how plants have stress, but as it turns out, uh, reactive oxygen is uh, really a fundamental in plants. It's not just, it's not, it's not about necessarily about stress. Stress is a, is an a overload of reactive oxygen that's unmanaged, right? But most plants manage reactive oxygen. They use reactive oxygen. In fact, plants, this is plants, animals, fungi, all of the advanced organisms uh, use reactive oxygen in their defensive uh, uh, mechanism as a defensive mechanism, and that is that it is it's it is the basic defense of all eukaryotes. You know, I mean, we animals, for example, we have what's called an added, or a, it's an additional system that involves uh, uh, T cells and antibodies and so forth. But the basic system is this ROS, this reactive oxygen defense system. So all organisms have it and they, uh, I mean, all eukaryotes, all advanced organisms have it and they use it uh, to manage uh, microbes. I mean, that's basically, that's basically what reactive oxygen is gotcha. about. It, yeah. it is a, it's more than stress. And, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's intimately involved with defense and nutrient extraction from microbes and rhizophagy. But, you know, it's, uh, but anyways, uh, did that, did that get it, Johan? Yes, you, yes, it did. Because yeah, okay. oftentimes yeah. I think anyone yeah. that's familiar with it, they're thinking about it. And it really yeah. is, you said it exactly what I was, what I thought you were going to say, which is the, the Ross is, is, is a constant part of plants. It's it, usually, I think it's under stress that it then becomes overwhelming for the plants to respond to that ROS production. And there's things like, I'm sure endophytes and other biostimulants can help mitigate that. Oh, they provide that antioxidant effect. So yeah, you did. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're, you're so welcome. In, in fact, the, the, I mean, if you look back in the, uh, this goes way back, but if you look back to the to the the evolution or the development of organisms on the planet you know be, before we had oxygen in the atmosphere we didn't have any advanced forms of life and part of that is because we needed to get you know we needed to get enough photosynthesis on earth and from the algae from the green blue green algae to develop oxygen in the atmosphere that then would enable the development of this 
reactive oxygen uh, defensive or microbial management system. So it was, it developed uh, early on in development of eukaryotes, the advanced cell types, you know, non bacterial types of organisms. And, and then it became more and more sophisticated as, as those organisms became multicellular and you have, you know, eventually you have people with this, you know, highly advanced uh, defensive system, uh, immune system in our, in our, in our system, in our bodies. Okay. But this is the early, earliest one. And, uh, uh, plants used in the rhizophagy cycle to manage these microbes. And if you look here at the picture here, I'm, I'm actually showing a, a root hair here of, of that cactus. And you can see little pairs of spherical structures. Those are the bacteria that are dividing inside that hair, inside that oh. root hair. And, uh, but all plants have these. And, and in fact, plants have communities of microbes that go into their structure. So it's not just into their, and their tissues and their cells. They don't just have one, but they'll have, you know, different kinds of bacteria that they take in. They'll have different kinds of fungi, you know, some yeasts that they'll take in. Some fungi will colonize the roots. So they will get communities of microbes into their structure. And they're healthy when they have all these microbes there. It's kind of like the human microbiome. You know, you, you have a human that doesn't have very many microbes in our intestines, and that person is very sick. Uh, but it, 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 if, if the person has a good mix of microbes uh, in the gut, then they don't have these kind of IBD and various kinds of diseases, gut diseases that people, that, that people can get. If we lose those microbes, we take antibiotics to remove those microbes. So plants are the same way. They need these microbes. Can okay, all plants have these crop plants, tomato, if you consider tomato, if you consider the tomato seed, uh, if you consider it inside the fruit of the tomato, uh, people think they're sterile, but it's not. In fact, around the seed, there's lots of microbes. And if you look in the seed, there's microbes. And this is just one of those microbes. This is a micrococcus, which is a, we like to use this micrococcus bacterium uh, because it forms its cells in tetrads. And so we could feed micrococcus bacterium to a plant and and then we can see it, it visualize the tetrads inside the cells and it, and it it can't be anything else because no structure in the in the cells will produce tetrads and so it can actually be visualized but this is a uh, an image of a uh, root hair a root actually a, a seedling root and uh, you can see the hairs over here to the left coming out there. Those are the root hairs. And you can see the tip over here. But the bacteria enter uh, the hairs, I mean, enter the root cells at this meristematic tip in this area. They will actually go in. And uh, So it's a specific zone. It is on, a specific yeah, zone. Yeah, that it's not it, just, it's it, not all, all no. over the root. It's only in one it's area. Not, yeah, yeah. No, it's a one way too because they go in at the root tip there at the meristematic area and then surviving microbes will be ejected out at the root hair so it's a one-way trip through the plant and in that goes from, microbes come from the soil they're attracted they're internalized uh, nutrients are extracted oxidatively using superoxide other reactive oxygen forms and and then surviving microbes some of those microbes are fully broke degraded uh, but other microbes can survive. And then those microbes that survive are ejected out of the root hairs at the tips of the root mm. hairs. And, the root hairs. and it's a one way trip. So through the, through the root, and this is only happening at the root, at the root tips, by the way, look at the, I, I have an image here that shows, uh, shows a root and you can see those tetrads. You can see the cells there, big old cells there. And you can see the Blue yeah, and it looks like they're only at the tetras. top of the cell or side of the cell. It's only one one. They're part only of the on the side, side of this cell here. Yeah, and we can go into this. We actually, we actually think that many of these microbes are being pressed in through the walls because the cell walls are soft. So we think they're being pulled in. Possibly one way is through nutrients. The other way may be through charges. There's charges on the tips of roots, and so uh, roots typically will have at the tips will have a negative charge and these microbes when they're coming from the soil uh, will are expected to have a positive charge uh, because they'll have cations so cations in them and these cations are are nutrients basically from the soil uh, nutrients like cal calcium and uh, 
and uh, uh, other 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 charged uh, nutrients that the plant can use actually that go in the uh, potassium, for example, go into the bacterium that will cause the bacterium to be slightly positively charged. And then uh, once they are attracted, once they come to the tip, they, they pull, we think they go down into the crevices between these cells and then they're pressed in to those cells as those cells grow. Because the cells, you know, these cells are initially they're small and when they get a little bit bigger, they, they grow. And so we think that's what presses them in. So in this image, you can see them in the side kind of a, at one end, we think that's because they were pulled down into the crevice there. And in fact, you can even see some that look like they're almost transitional, like that middle one looks like it may have been pressed in. To mm -hmm. that, yeah, to I, that do see, I, know, I do notice that. Yeah. It is kind of, uh, yeah. Kind of so, I mean, that's uncertain, you know, that's uncertain, but that's what we're thinking at this point, trying to figure this out, right? We know yeah. they go in because we can see them going in. That's, and is it is it yeah. certain groups that you're d discovering? It, it, in of uh, bacteria that are going into the plants, you mentioned the micrococcus. Are there what? How many other different types of bacteria have been uh, identified as being part of the rhizophagy cycle? Uh, some bacteria go in. Some bacteria don't appear to be affected at all. Mostly, the bacteria we identify are in uh, gamma proteobacteria. Some that's a one group of bacteria. These are mostly the common bacteria that people who work with biostimulant microbes are actually familiar with. Things like Bacillus and Pseudomonas are common, but you have things, Klebsiella, and you have some other, some of the, some of the uh, uh, rhizobial bacteria go in. There's a whole lot of bacteria that go in. Many of them don't, you know. Uh, what is it determines which ones go in? We're not exactly certain. Uh, and and we don't have a complete list, for one thing, because the bacteria that we can work with and experiment with are the ones that we can grow in culture, right? And then we can get that and purify it and identify it and then use that in our experiments. But if we can't isolate it, if we can't grow it in culture, if it's an unculturable, then we can't test it. And so, you know, we're uh, that limits the amount of information we can gather from uh, from some microbes, right? I mean, they may, mm -hmm. in fact, plants may be taken in culturables and unculturables. You know, we just, we, we don't know much about the unculturables. Gotcha. Yeah. You, so, you, you had mentioned that um, you, were, you find the bacteria, the endophytes around the seeds. So they're, the bacteria are being transported to other parts of the plants. And if there, it's a plant that is, consumable, one that that's edible that we consume, are those bacteria then beneficial to us as well? And isn't it important for us to consume food that has, it contains these endophytes? Yeah, a lot of these, uh, I mean, for example, if you consider tomato, I mean, there does appear to be a connection between plant microbes and, and human animal microbes. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about it in a second. Okay. Okay. First, I will first I will mention that these, which recaps what you said, these are soil microbes that the plant can absorb right into the roots and get nutrients out of them. But some of these, as you said uh, accurately, some of these the plant actually will move up into the seeds and up into the flowers and and onto in, even into the leaves. But especially onto the seeds, they'll 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 go into the seeds. So when you when you plant a seed, it, it are, provided it was produced correctly and its parent plant was grown in a spot where there's lots of microbes there, and so it can take those microbes and spread them to the seeds, uh, those seeds will have really some, some of the best microbes in them that will then stimulate development in the seedling when it, when it germinates. So these microbes are really important, especially for seedling development. And then, and then the other aspect that... Uh, that you alluded to is the uh, idea that uh, plant microbes, plants are absorbing these microbes from soil and then soils. And then when we consume the plant, uh, uh, that those microbes then can go into our intestinal tracts. And uh, we, we see that this really, um, this connection uh, emphasized in a way, when you look at a plant like tomato, 
uh, when we look at tomato seeds, the endophytes tend to be very similar to the ones that that are in animal intestinal tracts and uh, uh, things like the Micrococcus luteus that I mentioned that one forms tetrads, the bacterium that forms tetrads, uh, Staphylococcus and E. coli and Acinetobacter. Uh, these are all gut microbes. We know them mostly from the human gut, but they're also endophytes in toma tomato. And uh, they may be similar because with uh, tomato uh, the, the, and some of those berries like that, they're actually adapted for animal vectoring uh, seeds where the animals like birds and mammals will eat like a tomato or peppers and will go through the guts of the animal. And in the guts, these my, these plant seeds may be uh, picking up uh, microbes. And then, and then when the seedling is deposited, uh, the plant will germinate and it'll have access to all of these other, other microbes. So all of these microbes that were in the, in the gut, uh, um, at, at the same, at the same time, uh, I mean, that tells you that, that, uh, the direction that microbes go in the other way from plants to animals is also possible. And that some of the, some of the, we know that some of the microbes in our guts are similar or, uh, identical, you know, we have bacillus in our guts as well, and we have some pseudomonads, some other species, pantoia, for example, in the human gut, that also is represented in in soils, but also in plants. So there also there also is this uh, connection. We also know that I mean we're getting into the human microbiome now, but this health connection is is important. We also know that human humans that live in tropical you know, close to nature, tropical societies in the jungles, for example, uh, native, native, native peoples uh, uh, are consuming a big diversity of plants and they have a huge diversity of gut microbes. Uh, so, uh, and, and on top of that, it's also known that people he, who even visit these uh, tribes and live with these people, eat what they eat, increase their gut uh, microbiomes at least temporarily while they're consuming those, living with those people and consuming their food. So, I mean, there is definitely a connection between microbes from the soil, microbes in plants, and microbes that people uh, in, in our guts, our own microbiome. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It, it, it supports an article I read not long ago where it, it was talking, it was focused on the human uh, microbiome and how the ratios and the types of microbes in our guts change over time and how it affects aging. So, I mean, it's all, it's all related, soil health, plant health, human health, and the research you're doing and others are doing just, it, it backs that up, just emphasizes why we need to be more educated about what we eat and how it's grown. It, it's true. I, I mean, and, and, and not only that, uh, considering how plants are getting their nutrients from microbes means we have to be more in touch with the ecology of our systems and uh, and try to you know use cover crops and practices that are you know would be considered more regenerative agriculture or biological agricultural uh, practices, you know, to kind of kind of manage this natural ecology of how plants work, as opposed to putting, say, liquid fertilizers on plants. Sometimes you can't get away from liquid fertilizer. You can't get away from fertilizers that have to be liquid, but from chemical fertilizers, sometimes you can't do anything else. But if you can, you know, you, you probably should for a number of reasons. And uh, anyways, this is a, this is the, actually, this is an image. This was the Pa this image is from a paper uh, by the Australian group, and uh, this is a young one of the young investigators in that paper. Chani Pong Fu was her name, is her name, but they wrote a paper actually uh, titled "Turning the Table: Plants Consume Microbes as a Source of Nutrients," and they uh, they they published this paper in uh, in Plus One. 
one of the open access journals. And this is the 2010, uh, I, don't, I don't think the day, oh, there it is. Pong Fu Lon Hani et al. 2010. So, and then they call this rhizophagy, rhizophagy, rhizophagy. Some of these images actually show bacteria in, for example, root hairs. And what they did was they, they uh, labeled their bacteria or their yeast with green fluorescent protein where they can where they can actually put a tag on the organism and then look at it using confocal microscopy or other fluorescent microscopy. And then the bacteria that they labeled or tagged will show with that green fluorescent protein. So they know what the bacterium they labeled, they isolated and then labeled and then put back in. It's the bacterium that we're seeing inside those plant cells, inside those root cells. So, uh, you know, so the, experiments all kinds of experiments have been done at this point to show this and it's a it's there's a there's a group in Germ this Australian group for one there's a group in Germany a group in Mexico and uh, other places that are actively working on the process now uh, we have some collaborators now in actually uh, uh, in Italy as well so there's there's people beginning to work on this all over and they're seeing the same things. But, but basically, the part that we added to the rhizophagy process was uh, some important details. And, uh, and that is that it actually is a cycle it, it called the rhizophagy cycle. And that is that the plants come from the soil. They go into at the root, at the, into the cells at the root, at the root tip, usually into the the outer or or the outer two layers of cells you can see them in one or two layers thick not into the core of the typically not in the core of the of the of the root but in the surface layers so everything that's happening in rhizophagy cycle is happening in those outer two layers uh, the epidermis layer and a cell layer beneath that uh, uh, where nutrients are being extracted from those microbes. So it's not throughout the root itself. It's just in a certain part of the root at that tip. And, and then uh, what happens is the microbes that survive, they are ejected out of those hair tips. And I'll show you some of that. When the hairs elongate, then it squirts those bacteria out into the soil. And uh, usually when they are squirted out, when they're ejected from those root hair tips, then there's a few, a little bit of exudates, a little bit of nutrients that go with them. So the plant feeds them with a little bit of nutrients so they can reform their cell walls and reform their, their flagella if they have that. So they can swim back out into the soil and acquire more nutrients. So they're not completely destroyed. They're, they're just utilized and ejected back into the system or a combination of both. It's a combination of both. Yeah. It's a combination of both. I mean, we can actually see, even for those that are ejected out, we can see that some of the older cells get fully degraded. And they swell and they're fully degraded. So it's a combination of both. It is a, the ones that survive are the ones that are able to survive, right? Those that are not oxidatively resistant don't survive at all. They're just fully oxidized. And so the ones that are dissolved then, and I guess probably those that are not fully dissolved, it's not just nutrients that they're absorbing, right? There are other metabolites that I'm sure that the plants are gleaning from the b bacteria that are maybe biostimulant related, or is it s solely nutrients? Or So we view this as a nutritional process, mm. but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, here, here's an example. Uh, aluminum goes into the plant from this process, in part from this process, oxidative process. And plants, for the most part, plants aren't using that. So there's also the possibility that there are other uh, molecules that are on on uh, microbes that are or fungi, because yeasts also can go in that that are being absorbed into the plant. Do the plants use them? Are they useful to the plant? Uh, I don't know, but this is a way. Uh, there's no doubt this is a way that larger molecules or larger po particles can also go into the into the root cells and and they can be oxidized the 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 uh, absorbed into the plant and I, I say that because we I had a student here from Brazil not uh, 
a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, before the pandemic, so it's a few years ago now. Uh, and she was looking at uh, these nanoparticles, silica particles, nanoparticles. And when she mixed the nanoparticles with bacteria and then put them onto the, put them onto the uh, seeds, uh, we later saw those nanoparticles clustered with bacteria inside the root cells. So uh, other particles uh, can go with those microbes. Now, are they just stuck between different bacteria when they're squeezed in? Or how exactly is that happening? Are they also charged and pulled in? We don't know. But we, can, but we know that other particles can go in. So there's the possibility that using this same process, uh, maybe, you know, maybe with, maybe with microbes entering, they can also bring some other uh, molecules into plants. So it is a, definitely a way that plants can acquire other soil molecules and, and particles, larger particulate materials, although we don't know a whole lot about that. Yeah, oh, that's that's yeah. pretty fascinating. It sounds like it's on. You're saying the absorption that I think that ties into. Um, I was re reviewing one of your presentations, cytosis. Right? Is that what you're referring to about being squeezed in or absorbed in, and st it is through the m m different mechanisms of cytosis or S cyclosis? Right. Cyclosis. cyclosis. Oh, okay. Cyclosis. I thought it was cytosis. Yeah, that's a different process. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you okay. about that. But yeah. yeah, cytosis though. Yeah, endocytosis was. Uh, I mean, you're correct in that using that term. I didn't, I haven't used it before, I don't think, but endocytosis, it's not in discussions about this. Uh, usually I talk about cyclosis, which is moving microbes or moving cytoplasm around inside cells. But cyto endocytosis is really the taking in, and it is an appropriate term, it is the taking in of things into cells. And this is, in a sense, even what we've described, a type of endocytosis. It's not, it's not the type where you see in like an amoeba, where an amoeba can re reach out and surround the particle of food and then degrade it once it's inside a vacuole. It's not like an amoeba engulfing something, but it has to go in through the, through the cell wall. Of the, the, but the cell walls at the meristems are thin and they're elastic. They're not hardened, so it's they're kind of soft. So it's it's easy for things to go through the cell walls at that point. Uh, so yeah, I mean that is a kind of endocytosis that is happening for breaking those bringing those microbes in. And people have hypothesized that plants in their roots can endocytize particles and particular organic material for example there's a a, a, tr a train of thought that uh, with organic farming that uh, a lot of these large particles nutrient particles organic particles might be endocytized or consumed by plants into their roots and so this is a mechanism where that kind of endocytosis could occur but it it, it most likely, any of those molecules would be uh, entering root cells uh, paired with soil microbes. I, I want to pause for a moment because I want to I want to uh, share with you a a real life example of this. It's interesting that you brought up the silica nanoparticles uh, because one of the one of the products that we manufacture we use silica nanoparticles as our source of silicon, and we. You know, a friend, a friend of mine, Dr. Wendy Zellner, who was on the podcast a couple episodes ago, came on to talk about silicon, and we were talking about absorption of silicon, how that's taken, you know, it, with regards to different forms and its monosilicic acid, the newer forms of um, nanostructured silica, and we have a grower, and this is an ornamental grower, so this is outside of mineral soil. It's a soilless system, a peat-based media. And this this grower has really adopted biological practices in that he's turning, relying more on uh, microbial mixes and products with a, uh, with a tremendous amount of different species. Right, I won't go into like the different ones as there's dozens, but uh, he's also using our nanostructured silica, and he was seeing differences. And he he explained that once. He added the nanostructured silica into the mix, which also is combined with organic acids. He saw additional effects. 
And we were wondering, okay, how is that entering the system? You're, you're putting it through the root zone. Um, we don't know the full mechanisms of how silica is uh, absorbed when it's not monosilicic acid, if it's a different form. So when you're saying they're the microbiology and seeing it under the microscope that paired together, that to me is indicating, ah, that may be the mechanism. We, I was suggesting maybe it's some silicate solubilizing bacteria, but maybe it's a combination thereof. I'm tending to, to see that nature isn't, isn't it's not uh, uh, one or the other. It, it tends to be a whole system of different things happening. We can't just put our finger on like, oh, this is what's going on, and this is the only thing that's going on. That's true. What you're saying is 100% true. And uh, the tendency for a lot of people is to try to interpret everything based on what we what we know already, you know, and we know that, you know, solubilized nutrients are what plants are getting. That's what, you know, typically what we know, right, based on history. But it, it turns out that's not necessarily 100% correct. It's not. I mean, it's it's definitely not 100% correct. It's mm -hmm. 50% correct or or 60% correct, right? The other part is this uh, micro vector nutrients into plants. And uh, that's a significant problem. I mean, if you, if you're a, if you go in, if you're a microbe that go in with, with the, with the uh, silica nanoparticles, if you, you know, pair the two and, and they end up inside the plant, we don't know what really is happening. I mean, how is that affected? You know, silica could dissolve in the plant, or if it's paired, if it's stuck with uh, around with the bacteria, cycling around in the in the in the root cells, uh, superoxide, reactive oxygen, highly potent, could could oxidize some of that silica away, or 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 result in solubilization or something of the silica. And I'm not a not a silica chemist, so I can't I can't tell you what exactly might be happening but but i mean the fact that it goes in and we can visualize the silica nanoparticles inside the root cells uh is significant and uh and especially because it's paired with the microbes that the plants are taking in and you know so that so that is a whole another avenue and i would think if you have a lot of silica particle nanoparticles going into root cells uh, some chemical processes could be happening that would solubilize some of those or or take some of those actually into the cytoplasm of the cells. So, yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, so rhizophagy cycle, if you look at this as a, I have a diagram of a root here, of a corn root. And so yeah, plants okay. actually, that plants that have lots of root tips, lots of branching, will do a lot of rhizophagy cycle. They'll be doing this at each of the root tips. And so if you look at a corn root, this is a diagram back from 1927, classic diagram of a corn root, and, and it has all these branches on it. Every single little branch, little tip in there is where rhizophagy cycle would be happening. And so grasses do rhizophagy cycle in a massive way. They're doing a lot of this. And plants that don't have as many branches do it less. They still do it, but they do it less. They may do it in the seedling phase. And some plants actually uh, will uh, will get mycorrhizal on their on their roots. And then once the mycorrhizae are there, the mycorrhizae, of course, will replace rhizophagy cycle. And the mycorrhizae then will start to absorb that. Uh, but that's a certain kind. Those would be ectomycorrhizal type fungi. Trees, for example, would do that. Uh, with uh, with grasses, you do have some kind of mycorrhizae that they get. They get be be vesicular or muscular mycorrhizae, but that's somewhat more limited. You still have all of this branching and all these tips happening, and you have all that rhizophagy happening. So, but plants plants get new like you said, plants get nutrients every way that they can, and rhizophagy cycle and consumption of microbes, oxidation of microbes is something that plants do to get a significant amount of nutrients. They also do the other things. They get micro, use mycorrhizae and they'll, they'll do a absorption of nutrients from, from solubilized nutrients in the soils. Now, is it bad if you only give them a chemical fertilizer? Yes, it's a bad. Uh, and the reason that's bad 
is because in the process, in the rhizophagy cycle process, plants are needing to oxidize these microbes. So they're using their oxidative systems, right? They're creating reactive oxygen. They're zapping the microbes. They're making them leak nutrients. They're actually removing the cell walls off of the bacteria. That's the first thing we can see. And and the, and then there are some of these uh, uh, bacteria breaking down completely. They're essentially extracting nutrients from those uh, microbes. But in the process of doing that, of getting nutrients from bacteria, they're becoming more oxidatively resistant. They're uh, becoming more oxidatively stress tolerant because they're creating their own uh, antioxidants, uh, catalases and, uh, and superoxide dismutase and phenolics and those chemicals that make the plant resistant to stress uh, are the same chemicals that they're producing because they're doing this oxidative extraction from the bacteria. And so if you remove the oxidative extraction, plants don't become hardy. And so you can make them grow big and give them fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, but they're not going to become stress hardy and they're going to be more susceptible to disease and so forth. You can definitely push them with chemical fertilizers, but they're not going to be as stress tolerant uh, as they would be. So if plants, if you fertilize them with chemical fertilizers, plants are lazy, essentially, and they, they don't become hardy, hardy. They don't upregulate their antioxidants and become stress tolerant. Uh, so, I mean, they'll do whatever. If you just give them solubilized nutrients, they'll do it and they'll take it and uh, they'll be happy unless you have a serious disease that comes along or you got stress, salt stress or heat stress or something like that. Yeah, that's it. so that's that kind of leads me to another question. I kind of walk this line where I, I, I got into agriculture because I was um, inspired by hydroponics and soilless agriculture. But over the years, have been blessed be, to be able to uh, had a gr degree. My degree was in field ag, so I've had this th these opportunities to work in both arenas. So, how important is it to have the rhizophagy have bacteria in a, in a hydroponic system? I mean, they, they it's it is a very efficient production production system. I think you know the amount of of produce that can be um, grown and harvested on, per acre is higher. Uh, but do you think that, um, one, certainly there's probably a lack of biodiversity in the root zone because it's, in many cases, uh, dependent upon salt-based fertilizers, but then also how might that impact the the health of the plant? I'm, I'm, the, the reason yeah. why I'm asking is I'm trying to figure out, are there better ways to to grow those crops in those systems? Because I'm a huge proponent of it, but I'm trying to yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> locate yeah, yeah. the... the so the, so the short answer is we really don't know, yeah. but we do have, but we do have some evidence to suggest that uh, hydroponics is not the best way to produce hardy crops. Although you can control the environment very well, and you can, the the reason it may not be the best way is because you are providing most nutrients um, in the uh, as liquid. Uh, in the liquid component. Uh, but there are microbes that plants get uh, in the process. And uh, of, I mean, you've seen uh, hydroponic systems where you could see, you know, roots getting coated with a slime layer of microbes. Uh, so uh, those microbes, uh, there may be some microbes going in and that could affect the whole process. And, uh, you know, so I said, we don't know. Okay, but... Um, we, I do have a student who's working on that, uh, one of my graduate students, Pure Pole is his name. Uh, and he is uh, Pure Pole Chianyunant. I have trouble pronouncing his name. He's been around for some time, but it's a, uh, his name is hard to pronounce. But uh, he's very sharp. And he's working on comparing hydroponic and aeroponic systems. And in the aeroponic system, in particular, uh, it does look like you can put microbes in there that may benefit the plant, although this is preliminary data now, and it's hard to say. And uh, aeroponics might be a 
a better system, or at least where oxygen, put it this way, some kind of oxygenated system may be better because uh, plants need oxygen in order to produce reactive oxygen, in order to produce superoxide to get nutrients from those microbes. So, uh, and we do know that if we exclude oxygen from roots, they cannot do rhizophagy cycle. They cannot make superoxide. If you have a flooded area in a field, uh, those plants don't grow very well. And we think the reason they don't grow very well is because they cannot uh, use, they cannot make, they can't get enough oxygen to make superoxide uh, and then control the microbes or extract nutrients from the microbes. So it's, a, it's almost like uh, in the flooded areas, it's like having no nutrients. The plants don't grow well, we think, because they're starved, they're not able to extract uh, or And also, they're not able to control these microbes. So some of these bacteria, if they go in and there's no oxygen there, the plant may not be able to manage them. So we, you may have you know excess development of microbes in the roots. We don't know everything that's happening here, but we do know that oxygen is necessary. And the, 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 the story is still open the, the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, whether or not... Uh, microbes are good in hydroponic systems. Uh, although I, I do say the preliminary evidence suggests that microbes can be used and just, I just can't say too much about that. Yeah. And, and you, you hit on it. I mean, the, 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 the concept of whether or not the plants need to be hardy, certainly in a field setting, yeah. that is, that is right. an absolute must, but in a controlled environment, agriculture, you're, doing everything you can to protect the plants, controlling the environment, steering them. If you're, say, if it's a, a fruiting crop like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, you steer that crop one way or other, vegetative or reaper or generative. Um, and so, it, yeah, that, that may not be as dependent on it. But I was curious, um, you know, down the road, as more research comes out as far as how it impacts plant health and then subsequently human health, because we can produce a tremendous amount of yield but the next evolution in crop production is nutrient dense food. Getting more, you yeah. know, harvesting yeah. more that 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 yeah. harvestable yeah. product per acre. Um, yeah. What is its nutritional value, and how does microbes play into it? But anyway, you, thank you very much. No, you're welcome. And there may be other ways to produce um, nutrient dense crops that are. Uh, that also have microbes that uh, can go into the human system and benefit the human. The human. I mean, um, for example, you could create uh, using consortia of microbes. You could create plants that have those microbes in them uh, by, for example, spraying the leaf tissues, and uh, some of those microbes go into the leaf tissues and even into the fruits. The young developing fruits they'll go into the fruits. So. You could potentially create uh, uh, probiotic uh, foods, crops, uh, using hydroponic systems, and uh, and uh, put the microbes in there and 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 create more uh, microbial dense and uh, nutrient dense uh, crops. So it doesn't all have to happen in the roots, right? I mean, that's my that's my that's my that's my point. Gotcha. And, uh, I mean, there are creative ways to. I mean, you got to know how to do it. You know, you can't just put it on and say it's there. You know, you'd have to check it and make sure it's going in, and uh, and maybe do a little. You know, look at it, make sure it goes in, find out which ones go, and do some metagenomics and check and see if those microbes you put on are going in. Make make sure they're the right microbes that you say you want in your probiotic crops. But uh, there are, there are ways to to do it, to create those nutrient and microbial rich uh, foods for people, even if you use hydroponics. So uh, uh, I used to ahead, own a, uh, a hydroponic store. Uh, I managed it and ran it from uh, 
2004 till uh, about 2018. And one of the big changes over the industry over the years was uh, when we first opened up, uh, most of the hydroponic stuff we sold, you know, came with some sort of a sanitizer, you know, be it peroxide based or uh, uh, or other. And uh, the idea was, is that you're always using something to, to keep the, the root zone completely sanitized of any bacteria humanly possible. But like you said, uh, when you did that, it'd grow big, pretty plants, but they'd always be weak. They'd always be susceptible to more disease, root rot, you know, and it would pop up more often. But as time progressed, uh, companies started coming out with these uh, bacterial based inoculants for your hydroponic systems, uh, you know, back, mostly bacillus based or trichoderma based, but uh, they have uh, changed the industry completely. So instead of uh, going with the scorched earth uh, uh, thing, they're using these beneficial bacterias to foster bacteria in the reservoir. And actually you almost get like a compost tea like effect, you know, and, uh, I found with uh, some systems, particularly uh, bare root systems like aeroponics, deep water culture, NFT, that uh, uh, with a proper setup and uh, those bacteria, I could use a lot less, if uh, little to none, mineral fertilizer and use more organic inputs and get a, a far better quality crop. But it was just a much more difficult balance because you never know what kind of microbes you're using. So it's always a shotgun effect. You're always using multiple different ones. You don't know which one's working. And uh, frankly, the price of a lot of these products are, you know, insulting on a good day. So uh, using them on a large scale is most of the time not practical. Plus they tend to create so much biofilm and extra, you know, like you say, they overgrow right, in the reservoir. Right, so right. you got to have some sort of a protein right. skimmer type situation. Otherwise the access microbes glom onto your roots and they create a root rot situation. Then you've got microbes fighting microbes. And uh, then it's, you know, once you got that going in the reservoir, it's just downhill from there. But when you can keep that balance of the healthy microbes, I've seen amazing results, uh, particularly, like you said, with the, those bare root systems, the, the, where you've got roots living in a highly oxygenated root system, or you've got that, you know, where they're being sprayed with a, a, a hydroponic solution that's almost uh, perfect every time with the pH, the right amount of parts per million, but not too much and certainly not too salty, you know? And uh, as soon as I started incorporating that with uh, uh, a lot of my hobby gardens and and my garden, you know, my quality, uh, you know, I started to get uh, a much higher quality uh, fruits and vegetables. And, and it's really why I, I switched from a mainly hydroponic uh, garden to mostly uh, organic living soils now, you know, because, you know, it's just yeah. better, better quality right. products and it's easier right. to do. You, you, you remind me of something, and that is that, I, that uh, you know, a lot of experimentation is happening na nowadays, these days, by people looking to do organic and regenerative and biological agriculture. And they're trying all kinds of things mm -hmm. you know, to, try to, to, try to, try to, to try to improve crop production, produce, produce cleaner, cleaner crops, and so forth. And so... Uh, and a lot of people who are doing this, they're not, uh, you know, they're not research people. They're working for companies, small companies, or they, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're experimenting at home, trying different things. And so people really are very creative. And, you know, I mean, this is just a human feature. You know, we have these universities and and some companies where we put, you know, we hire really smart people, right? But a lot of people are doing this, and they're very, very creative. It's it's amazing how um, how widespread this create people mm -hmm. are creative in terms of growing uh, crops in new ways, you know. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm never, I mean, I'm always surprised when I find that people are doing that uh pleasantly surprised uh but it's pretty frequent uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, that they that i learned that people have done that and uh, some of these are companies you know and they do crazy things you know like for example uh uh would be a foliar fertilization you know there's this still a debate about foliar fertilization whether that does anything right mm -hmm. but uh in terms of plants because the reason it's a debate is because people have this misunderstanding about how plants work. Mm -hmm. And the, the understanding that most people have is that, oh, plants have roots, and those roots absorb solubilized nutrients from the soil, and that's how plants work. I mean, everybody knows that. We know, we've, we've learned that, we learned that in third grade, I think. And, uh, but, but the fact is that, uh, 
plants are absorbing microbes into their roots, and they also are absorbing microbes into their aerial parts. And uh, some of those nutrients go right in with those microbes can go if you if we we've done experiments where we foliar fertilize uh, plants uh, it, it, with uh, with some micronutrients right this is what most people do for foliar fertilizers they use micronutrients tiny mm-hmm. tiny amounts and you see uh, responses in plants at least we see responses in plants in 24 hours it's amazing how rapidly plants can absorb nutrients through their leaves and meristematic areas. And uh, it, as it turns out, plants have microbes on their leaves, as you, as you all are probably aware, but they're taking those microbes into their leaf cells. Mm-hmm. And we can also see them in leaf cells like trichomes, for example, where the trichomes get some microbes in them, some of which appear to be fixing nitrogen because we can stain for fixed nitrogen and we've got done some isotopic tracking experiments that suggest that those microbes and leaves are actually absorbing uh, nutrients from the uh, from the bacteria I mean that the plant is absorbing nutrients from the bacteria some of those bacteria are fixing nitrogen from the air so uh, plants you can put microbes onto developing leaves and you can put fertilizers micronutrients onto those leaves. Mm-hmm. I imagine if you put too much, you're going to hurt the plant, but if tiny amounts and you have huge response that goes all throughout the plant. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the uh, earliest tricks I learned at the store from an older gardener was a uh, foliar spray with liquefied seaweed. You know, and it's loaded with micronutrients and, uh, uh, yeah. you know, it makes plants happy and bugs hate it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's probably a microbial stimulation effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. You put the you put the the micronutrients on the leaves, and you put the with the seaweed there, uh, and microbes. Are, actually, some of those the seaweed actually has some bacteria in it too, mm-hmm. and so some of those are absorbed probably directly into the leaves. You know, we don't know a whole lot about that, but uh, from what we can tell, that seems to be happening. So this picture is a root, a lateral root, and you can see the bacteria around the root, right? See the blue cloud, there's blue clouds around the root tips. That's where the bacteria are being taken in to that, into those root tips. Yeah, right in that little zone that you showed right before. Right in that zone, yeah, right in yeah. that zone. You can see this zone now right there. And you see, actually you can see to the left, you can see some root hairs coming out too. So you can see the, the root hairs are always to the past. So they're going in here and they're going out over here through the tips of the hairs. Okay. And this just kind of shows, uh, you know, I'm not going to say too much about this, but you can see the purple, the picture to the left, that's a root tip. And this is, this is using a dye called crystal violet that has a positive charge. And you can see it goes at this root tip that we say has a negative charge and it just attaches right there. So that's some of the data that suggests this, these tips are negatively charged. We can also put little voltmeters in there and measure differences between the tip and the other part of the plant. So it it looks like, you know, we haven't done a whole lot of that because many of the roots we're working with are real tiny, but we can see differences there. And uh, uh, if you look over at C here, uh, you can actually see a root hair and you can see where the root hair ejected some bacteria from the from at what was the tip, and then the tip turned because it had all these bacteria here at it, turned, and then you have this other branch coming up where it's going to eject more bacteria from that tip. In fact, it's darker at that other tip, and that may be the bacteria that are in there. So these bacteria are being ejected out of those root hairs just to show that. And this image actually shows that again with the bacteria in it. And this is actually a bacillus that we added. Uh, And uh, this bacillus, you can see, this is the meristematic area right here at the tip, the purple area. So that's where it goes in. This is the the negatively charged area. That's why it's so purple. And you can see the little round dots in there. Those are the bacteria that went in. And if you look here beneath that, you see another picture. You can see the bacteria a little bit higher mag, but you can see the the blue wall around it, and you can see the bacteria in the middle. That's when they first go in. As that root develops, as those cells develop, you go 
to the left of this image, you can see the cells are getting bigger, but you can also see these bacteria are no longer round. And if you look close up of it, look beneath, there's a picture of it. You can see the walls are coming off now and the bacteria are starting to divide. So this actually, where these cells are getting bigger, this is the bacterial replication zone inside those cells. And you can also tell kind of, if you look at the outside here, you can see the outer cells there have them in it and the inner cells, you don't see too many in there. So they really are going in, even though you see them here at the tip, these, the tip is, we're looking mostly at the upper cells here. This is the outer layer of cells. So as we get bigger root, the, we're seeing it to the inner cells. You can see those inner cells don't really have the bacteria in them. It's really just these outer two or three layers there. But uh, there's this distinct zones when bacteria go in. And of course, the plant's getting some nutrients from those bacteria that go in and, and then lose their cell walls. So the plant can get all those nutrients that are on the cell walls too. And that and, and bacterial cell walls, you have proteins, you have peptidoglycan proteins, typical bacterial cell wall components. You've got calcium in the cell walls. You've got, uh, you've got metals hanging on the cell walls, some molybdenum and and other, other kinds of metals that just kind of stick to the cell walls. And so all that is going into the plant when they oxidize these microbes. And whatever was on the cell walls, the plant can get readily absorb that, what it needs. And I guess some of the material may remain in those cells as waste products. We don't know. We don't, we don't actually see them in the root hair. So maybe they're gone at that point. I don't know. Oh, that's a close-up of that. And you can see the arrow here. You can see this is where the walls are being sloughed off. The arrow to the right, you can see actually two cells there. You can see the kind of irregular dark wall material. You can see it in several places. That's where the walls are actually falling off there. This shows another image. Uh, this is a pseudomonas. This is another bacterium. Uh, but you can see it's a chain there. And you can see, and this is what I was talking about. If you look at the smallest one in this chain over here at the right, when these bacteria are dividing in there, or the plant is forcing them to divide, actually, because it's a, it, either it's divide and, and replicate yourself or die from superoxide. Uh, you can see the smallest ones over here at this right arrow. Uh, there is actually, they're blue, and that's proteins they have in them. But if you look at the bigger ones on that chain, the older ones in the chain, you can see there's no or very little blue standing there. That's because Yeah, the you can proteins, see they almost look hollow. Yeah, they look hollow. What happens is the superoxide goes in and then starts clipping up those proteins and starts oxidizing the proteins. So the proteins will break down, and then those will then diffuse out and can be absorbed by the plant. You know, are they going all the way to nitrate? We don't know. I mean, there could be it could be little forms of amino acids and stuff. Plants can actually absorb like certain amino acids, so they may be getting some breakdown products of proteins uh, that they're able to absorb directly from that. But when the proteins are clipped up in these cells, the the cations like uh, potassium, for example, are actually linked. They're, they're, they're not physically attached, but they're by charges, they're linked to those proteins. And so when the proteins go out, the potassium goes out. And so plants can get a lot of potassium through rhizophagy, through this rhizophagy process and processing, really taking them right out of the cytoplasm of these, of these microbes. So, and that's, that's a, my, one of my graduate students is Celeste Zahn. She's uh, working on some uh, working on this process. And she, she actually labeled some pseudomonads with a stain called M. cherry. And this is similar to the green fluorescent protein that, uh, that, that I mentioned earlier that the Australian group used. And then she fed that to plants. And in this case, I think it was clover plants. And, and then she put that under a confocal microscope uh, with a laser that would make that M cherry tag that she used turn red, and so you could visualize it. And so the the what you're seeing in here are the sloughed off root cap cells, they're plant cells, and you see the red dots in there. Those are the bacteria inside those cells. Wow, that's really something. And it just this like scans through that, so you can see the you can see the scanning through that. And uh, this is readily, every plant does this. It's, it's funny. It really is strange that people have not seen this before. 
uh, because it is so easy to demonstrate it and so easy to see it. But it's that blinder that people have where we think we know already how things work. And so we don't think that plant cells get you know, internalize any microbes. And it's certainly we don't think that's a nutrient absorption or extraction process. So it's people have blinders on. And uh, you mean that the science is settled mentality? <laughs> it is. It is like science is settled. Uh, but it's but it's worse than that. It's it is that we think we know the answers already. You know, I mean, this is a common phenomenon with mm -hmm. we think we know how things work already. And so anything that doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And so people ignore it. People don't see it. So, anyways, this is this is this is you know. It, uh, I take my hat off to the Australian group that first noticed this. I don't know how they how they first noticed it. I, I I suppose the first thing they did was to label their microbes and then put them in and then examine them and see that oh, what are they doing in there? You know, I I don't know. I haven't spoken to them in that in that to that extent, but, uh, I take my hat off to them. I mean, they were, they were correct. And the process is fantastic and all plants do it. It's not just yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing. Well, doc Dr. White, I want to jump in there for a moment. Um, yeah. yeah. Looking at your, your presentations and your body of work. And I really feel, um, from your work that you're really trying to draw attention to, um, you know, healthy soils, cycling soils, um, regenerative type practices in ag. Um, Josh and I and Johan spend our time trying to convince growers um, and agronomists how important uh, living soils are. If you were to try and communicate this principle or a part of this um, to a grower, to a or an agronomist, what would be what would be the the number one um, portion of this that that might really impact ag in your opinion? How what is the most important part of this to communicate? Well, what what I think the most important thing for everybody to understand is that this is how plants get nutrients. This is they are getting a part of their nutrients by absorbing microbes and extracting nutrients from them. And if you, and, and that, that that process relates to healthy plants. And, and uh, it opens the way that we can reduce costs of agriculture, for one thing, the costs of fertilizer, and, uh, and also preserve the environment and possibly create much healthier foods. You know, so this is what plants naturally do. And in, in squirting, squirting fertilizer into the soil or putting chemical fertilizer into the soil, especially soils that have become depauperate of microbes in, in our standard kind of agricultural systems that we use, uh, um, that is a perversion. It's a perversion of plant nutrition. That, that is, yeah, plants can get their nutrients that way, but the healthy plants, the plants in nature, do it. Part of the nutrients are coming through rhizophagy, and that, that is a microbe-connected process. It's also a healthy soil process, so you have to have food for the microbes out there. But there are also maybe ways to tweak it, you know, ways to, you know, provide, for example, um, amino acids or something as a nitrogen source and let the microbes carry that into the plant. The problem with nitrogen, particularly nitrogen, but uh, some types of fertilizers, is that when you put them on the plant, the plant stops rhizophagy. The plant will stop, particularly with nitrogen, the plant will stop secreting exudates and will stop taking in microbes and instead will rely on uh, uh, absorption of solubilized chemicals. And uh, that has consequences. And we're seeing the consequences uh, in terms of uh, environmental pollution and uh, you know, high costs, fertilizer costs and so forth. Uh, probably, probably also some health consequences that people have. We'd probably be 
much closer to in terms of uh, of our of the native peoples who live closer to nature. We'd be closer to them if we were eating uh, regenerative, regeneratively or biologically grown, organically grown crops. You know, so so the biggest thing is that this is the absorption of microbes into the roots for nutrient extraction. The process we call rhizophagy is a critical way that plants in nature get nutrients. And uh, it, it makes sense that we should be trying to encourage that process. If we want to tweak it and make it you know, more efficient or push plants in some way, we should be trying to incorporate that as part of that process, you know, providing some of the nutrients from my, through microbes, soil microbes. Uh, as opposed to just abandoning the whole process and using chemical fertilizers and other kind of modern agricultural practices. So, I mean, I think that, I actually think that if people understand that this is how plants get a good part of their nutrients uh, and that this is a, f that healthy plants get their nutrients this way, that that it, people, it changes the way people think about, about growing plants and that they... It, you know, would be, are more open or would will be more open to exploring growing crops using a regenerative agricultural approach. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, that's exactly what you said, but a little more. I mean, that is exactly why I talk to and give as many talks as I do. It's not because I like to see myself online or hear, hear myself on on online it's it it's because i think this is important and that it will change the way people think about how plants work and how we should be growing plants so yeah i mean i think it and, and it does fit i didn't realize it when we first discovered it I and mean, we didn't set out to to find something that was important for regenerative agriculture but as it turns out this is a key uh, phenomenon that supports uh, regenerative agriculture, why we should be doing it and how it, how some of the, you know, nutrient acquisition in regenerative agriculture and biological agriculture, how that works. And so this is a, this is, this has become something of a, you know, a key element for regenerative agriculture. But we didn't, set out to make it that way we just published a paper did some research studied on studied worked on endophytes all my life and of course i thought endophytes were important uh uh and this is this is an extension of this endophyte work because these microbes are all also endophytes in plants they will go into the plant cells as endophytes and these endophytes i didn't say anything about that but those that is endo for endo fight for plant basically it's any kind of microbe that goes into plant tissues and so this is where plants are actually actively taking in microbes to become endophytes so that those microbes then become endophytes even though it may be for a short period of time or the microbes may be degraded in the process i'm not going to talk too much about that but this enzyme in plants that produces the superoxide is an enzyme that we uh, present in root cells, present in all plant cells, but it's a, actually an enzyme called NADPH oxidase, and it, it takes molecular oxygen, produces superoxide. Okay, and so that, it's this enzyme uh, that needs that molecular that oxygen from the air to make the superoxide that, that it can then extract nutrients from those microbes with. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, but as it turns out, if you take these microbes away from plants, they can't grow right. Uh, I mean, if we, for example, take seeds and uh, grass seeds, for example, and remove all the bacteria from them, and we can remove at least most of the bacteria, maybe not all of them, but most of the bacteria, we can remove it by surface sterilizing seeds. And we, we do some super sterilizations that are like an hour in 50% 50 50 Clorox. So we really sterilize. That's more than almost anybody else does in terms of sterilizing. And that's, that's another thing that has limited uh, people 
understanding what's going on with this process because very, very few scientists really sterilize plants to see how they develop. And, uh, and usually sterilizations are much less than that, maybe 10 minutes or five minutes, something like that. They basically, which does nothing really, doesn't remove the microbes. It eliminates slightly, reduces slightly. But uh, if you remove all the microbes, then uh, roots don't have any root hairs. They won't form root hairs. And other behavior changes happen, like, for example, you remove the microbes and then roots don't know where they are. They don't know they're supposed to grow down, so they stop. I mean, I mean, basically, I mean, obviously, there's a developmental program that roots follow. And when they have microbes there, they have go with gravity and the roots grow down. But when we remove the microbes, they don't grow down. Sometimes they go in the air like that. Or they'll just go on the surface. Occasionally, you'll get some movement down, but typically not. So that whole gravitropic behavior response depends on these microbes that are that are doing. They're also root branching and shoot more shoot growth and so forth. So you see big effects when you remove those microbes. This is actually a Bermuda grass seedling root where we remove the microbes, and you can see. There's no hairs there. You can see little bumps there. Those are actually the hair initials. So the plants will make these hair initials, but unless there's bacteria that go into those root hair initials, little bumps on the root, they don't elongate. You don't get root hair. So it'll just stay like that. So plants are kind of programmed uh, to have these bacteria in their tissues. And if they don't have them, they don't develop right. It's really, no one else has seen that before. Actually, there was a scientist who saw that. There was a scientist, a guy named Walter Kelly, and I was a graduate student at Auburn back in the 70s or 80s, early 80s. He was a, a, a tree scientist, a forester, and he, he said, he published a little paper about it, that if you took pine seeds and removed all the bacteria from it, sterilized it rigorously, no root hairs form. And... Uh, it was just a little tiny little thing, but that's exactly what we see when we remove those microbes. That's exactly what we see. So Walter Kelly at Auburn back in the 80s made that observation, but it never went anywhere. Okay, but you see the Bermuda grass when we put, if we put, if we take that sterilized Bermuda grass where, there's, uh, where we removed all the microbes and then we put them back on the bacteria. And here's where we put a, this picture shows where we put a, a bacterium on it, a pseudomonad of Pseudomonas species, put it on the seed after we removed it, and now you see the hairs immediately. Hairs begin to form. And if you look at this, it's a little bit older roots, older parts of the roots. You can see actually uh, these root hairs form. They're long, and all the little brown dots in there, they're actually full of bacteria. And this is stained for reactive oxygen. Where, wherever there's react, re, reactive oxygen around the bacteria is brown. And so all these brown, and if you look at the root itself, you see little brown dots there. And those are the bacteria inside those root cells. Here, there's a close-up of a root hair. You can see the bacteria inside that root hair of that grass. Again, yeah, you can clearly see them there. You can see them really. You can see them really clearly here, and they're replicating in there. And and when that root hair elongates, it's going to eject them out. The reason we think, and we did a paper on this recently, the reason we think that uh, there's this linkage between root development, particularly root hair growth. And the presence of bacteria inside the hairs, root hairs, is because the bacteria uh, are producing hormones. And uh, one hormone that they're producing is ethylene. And ethylene is a growth hormone for plants. It's a maturation, maturation hormone, but it's also a growth hormone. And it will trigger, we think the bacteria are producing ethylene in the root hair tips and that's causing the hairs to elongate. And I'll show you a picture of that. I mean, that is they actually accumulate, the bacteria will accumulate in the tip of the root hair. And then in mass at the tips, they'll secrete ethylene. And they'll also secrete another hormone, nitric oxide, or nitric oxide will be formed in the process. And nitric oxide is another hormone. And both ethylene and nitric oxide have been linked to root hair elongation, but most of the work that people have done have they've they've suggested that that both of those chemicals are 
hormones are produced by the plant. Well, we have evidence that it's produced by the bacterium in those hairs and in those root hairs. And uh, uh, this is actually my graduate student who's doing that, Ivy Chang. She's getting close to graduating here, but she's an extremely capable young lady. And uh, she, she actually did this work with the hormones and some other industrial type projects. Uh, but uh, uh, what she has found, basically, you can actually look at the picture here, that, that microbes accumulate in the root hair tips. They produce those hormones like ethylene, and then that causes elongation. So it's the ethylene, uh, but I'll say just hormone, hormone, microbial produced hormone hypothesis. Uh, I wanted to show, also, I wanted to talk about when those hairs are forming, it's not a static process. So the picture we showed is not, uh, is not exactly the only thing that you have happening in these root hairs. And most, most people, when they extract root hairs from the soil, you get a plant and you look at it with a microscope, you don't see any movement in it. It's just kind of a static structure. And so, uh, but, but actually what's happening when those plants are alive is you have this life, you have this movement. This is where the cyclosis comes in, Johan, that we talked about, that you talked about earlier, that you brought up earlier, or I think was referring to, or mentioned, or we mentioned. Uh, cyclosis, and that is the streaming or cell streaming that happens inside root hairs. And this is a plant that shows that all plants will do it. We find it in grasses, we find it wherever we can actually look at the root hairs growing under a microscope uh, without pulling the plant. If you pull the plant out, you actually will stop that process because that process involves, you know, a cyto what's called a cytoskeleton in the plant. And the plant has, you know, filaments, protein, protein cytoskeleton that that makes it able to move, right? But if you break that skeleton, that cytoskeleton, there's no movement. Just like if you ran over us with the car, broke all our bones, we couldn't move at all. I mean, the same thing happens with plants. And so if you break that cytoskeleton by pulling the plant out of the soil, you don't get any cyclosis or cytoplasmic streaming. But this is a sedge. And if you look at the root of the sedge, you can see the bacteria beneath this, the root here. The red areas here are the bacteria in there. And they're out in that space just underneath the cell wall called the periplasmic space. So they're kind of some of these may also go into this into the cytoplasm itself. So you can see some of those look like they're in the cytoplasm. They may actually be in the cytoplasm. We have some ultrastructure work that suggests at least some of these microbes do actually go into the cytoplasm of the cell. But if you look at above, you see a root hair, and you can see all the motion. You see the movement. You see the movement, those shadows going around. Those are Yeah, the like a little bacterial highway. It's like a bacterial highway. The plant is circulating those microbes. We think that that is that that's an important part of this process that, that's happening in root in roots. And uh, for one thing, that enables the, the bacteria to, I mean, the plants to replicate the bacteria by jostling them around, right? And so this actually shows one of these root hairs. You can see the clusters of bacteria and you can see the little ones that again, staining dark with the protein. This is with the aniline blue. Aniline blue, you can see this is DAB plus aniline blue. So the blue, the dark blue ones have more protein and the older ones uh, have less protein, the bigger ones. And again, that's that oxidation process happening in these microbes. But the plant is actively cultivating and reproducing these microbes. So the bacteria that survive in these root hairs, in the root cells, and then, and then in the root hairs, that survive and get replicated are the best ones to work with these plants. And those are the ones that the plant then will eject back out into the soil in greater numbers from the tips of root hair so they can get more nutrients. So the plant essentially is cultivating these microbes by putting nutrients, attracting them in, extracting nutrients from them uh, inside the root cells, replicating them inside the hairs, making higher numbers, and then injecting them back out into the soil from the tips of the hair. So plants are actually farming or ranching. Uh, you had uh, Jeff Lowenfels on here once, or he, I think he was connected with your... We're, we're with your going group. to, yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, we plan on having Jeff on. He has not been on yet, though. So Jeff called it ranching. Yeah, that's Microbes. a good way to put it ranching soil microbes because uh, he latched on to the idea that 
uh, a lot of the nutrients are coming off the cell walls of these bacteria. And uh, if that's the case, then if you're like ranching sheep, right, you take the sheep, you, you bring them into the barn, into your root, you shear them, you shear their wool off, and you bring off their, their cell walls, and replicate the microbes and put them back in. But I mean, that also is just part of the story because some of these microbes are also being degraded fully. And so they're getting nutrients out of the cytoplasm of these microbes as well. And, uh, and then ejecting uh, nutrient poor or minimally loaded mi microbes back out into the soil where they get more, you know, so it's a, it's kind of a more dynamic process than, than, than only the kind of ranching, unless you consider, well, eating some of the, of the microbes as well. I guess that's yeah. where ranching, you can eat some sheep there too, not just shear the right. walls, but eat the sheep too. Yeah. So, okay. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's an analogy that works. Both of those analogies, farming, my plants, farming microbes, plants, ranching microbes is uh, both of those analogies work. This actually shows those bacteria. This is a root hair and you can see the living root hair. You can see this microbes moving around these little white bumps as they go around and you can see them accumulating at the tip. This is what happens is they will accumulate. The tip is actually inside this root hair. The tip is a skinny little thing. And so these bacteria can, it's almost a needle shaped thing. The bacteria go around that needle shaped point. And this tip of the hair is also elastic. So the bacteria, while they're maybe pulled around, they only occasionally will be caught from the tip and then pulled back and then replicated as they go around. And they'll accumulate then after accumulate then at the tip. And at some point, those microbes at the tip will secrete these hormones, ethylene and nitric oxide. And then they'll eject those out into the, out in, from the tip of the, and that ejection happens when that hair elongates. So growth of the hair and ejection of microbes from the tip of the hair are linked. And the microbial, the process of moving these microbes back into the soil is linked to hair, root hair development. So you don't have root hair development without ejection of microbes. You don't have root hair development without presence of microbes in there. So those processes are linked. And so we hypothesize that it, it is entirely possible that many plants, maybe all plants have root hairs or evolved or developed root hairs, or the good Lord made root hairs on plants uh, in order to manage these microbes and maybe less significant is absorption of nutrients by the root hair. Now, we don't know if that's true because we do know, at least there's some experiments, there's experiments in a lot of data or some data, not a lot of data that suggest that root hairs are important in nutrient absorption as well. But it may be that, that they may, that's not the only reason that root hairs developed and there may be there may be this other microbial pro and i mean certainly root hairs are linked to this microbial process certainly development of the root hair you know so that's suggestive in itself you know so, but you do get benefit in terms of absorption of nutrients from liquid in the soil solubilized nutrients so okay so this just shows another root hair there some of these hairs get really fat and if you look at a root hair with microbes in it, you'll see that many of them are really fat and they're not fat because of the hair itself. The plant part of the hair is really tiny inside that root hair. It's all the microbes that are around that tip. And so here actually is a picture. I'm showing a picture of one of these root hairs and you can see Outside it, to the left with this arrow is, you can see the bacteria coming out the tip. And some of those are reforming their rods. They're reforming their rod shapes, their cell walls, and getting their rod shapes back. But inside, you can see some of these that are red, and that, that's stained for reactive oxygen. But some of these are white, where they're not in contact with the, they don't have reactive oxygen. Uh, they're not staining for reactive oxygen, but they're still in there. They're still, the whole fatness of this uh, hair 
is predominantly microbes in it. And so they are just these root hairs just pump out microbes. That's their function. That's their function. I mean, that's what we're alleging anyway, at least part of their function is in processing these microbes. And you only see root hairs, by the way, at, around these root tips. So you don't see them in older parts of plants. So older parts of plant roots, uh, they don't have hairs on them. They've lost their hairs. They don't function like that. So they really, root hairs are only present where we have rhizophagy cycle happening at root hair tips. That's another linkage to uh, root hairs and the rhizophagy cycle or processing of microbes, uh, which again is not what we, you know, not according to our dog dogma. I mean, we all know how root hairs work. We've known that since third grade or fourth grade, whatever it is, you know, uh, but it may not be correct. That may be only partially correct, but this is what happens. This is a little cartoon, a little diagram that actually shows uh, what happens in the root hair. You have growth spurts and uh, this a, a, B, C, and D show different stages in root hair development and injection of microbes. And you can see that over here at A, you can see a root hair, and you can see the microbes accumulating at the tip. They produce the hormones, ethylene, nitric oxide, and that causes a growth spurt. And then those bacteria are ejected out of the tip through little pores. And you can see they're coming out, and then they go out into the soil and acquire more nutrients. But those that are here on the sides survive. They stay in there. They're not ejected. Then those are replicated again. You can see these blue ones are the back blue bacteria that are not ejected. They're replicated, and then they will accumulate again at the tip. And then at the tip, they are uh, they will then secrete ethylene, and they'll secrete nitric oxide. And then there, and that causes another growth spurt. And then they're ejected from the from the tip again. So you have this junk, 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 junk ejections every time you have a tip. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the complexities of it, but there is a, an interchange that happens uh, between the microbe and the plant. And this little diagram that I show suggests that. And uh, basically, I'll say very briefly how that works. The, plant, the microbes secrete ethylene. That causes the plant to secrete exudates or sugars exudates to the microbes, but it also will cause the microbes, the plant, I mean, the plant will detect that ethylene. That's how they detect the microbe is there. Uh, they'll detect the ethylene and then they'll secrete uh, superoxide as a result of that ethylene. And that superoxide will then cause the plant to produce antioxidant nitrogen or nitric oxide, which is an antioxidant. And the microbe will secrete that antioxidant and maybe other forms of nitrogen. We don't understand everything about this uh, kind of because of the tools we're using and that we don't have, there are not techniques to look at very fine chemical interactions. At least we don't know how to do it yet. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, but um, that nitrogen is produced as an antioxidant to counteract that superoxide and it will combine with the superoxide and you end up getting nitrate. nitrate and then the plants absorb that nitrate as a nitrogen for source. So you have this interaction happening, and uh, we just published something about that recently. But uh, this is just a diagram that shows the cyclosis and the accumulation of bacteria there. Um, this is actually what happens is you have successive ejections as, as growth spurts happen. And this is a root hair. Uh, where you can actually see the bacteria that were pressed into the wall where each growth spurt happened. And, and instead of being ejected, it was, it was pressed into the wall. And you can see the dark areas there in that root hair. Those are the bacteria that weren't completely ejected. And, uh, but this, this shows how that, how that happened. You have those growth spurts. And so this, you know, if you go back timing this, this looks like every 15, 20 minutes or something like that, you had an ejection. It may not be that fast. Uh, it's harder to see these ejections. We know they happen, but it's harder to catch them. And uh, we don't exactly know, you know, whether there's something that's guiding the process here, whether it's just running internally based on microbes that accumulate and then causing a growth spurt or whether there's some daylight signal that's happening. We don't understand exactly how plants are controlling this process. We, we can see it though. And uh, there's actual physical ejection, though, 
from the tips. This picture, I have a picture that I like to show a lot uh, because it really illustrates this very well. This shows an ejection, ejections of bacteria from root hairs of tomato. And what you can see is if you look in the image, if you're able to go online and see the image here, uh, to root hair number three down here, you can actually see three holes, three pores in there. And those are the pores that the bacteria are ejected through when that, when that, and you can also see there's a swelling that happens in the base of the hair and it progresses. And so those bacteria that were accumulating in the tip uh, get squeezed out uh, from the tip of that root hair. Yeah, that's and, pretty fascinating. Uh, you can see them being extruded from the roots. It is. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. It is and pretty unfortunately, fascinating. Um, Dr. White, we are running close to on time. That's one of the dangers of being a business. We, we got a yeah. meeting coming up. Is there anything else, um, it, uh, any more profound uh, slides you want to show before we unfortunately have to, to wrap up? Profound. Or anything you really, some, really, some main points you want to hit a, upon before. That's, <laughs> a, that's a good point. Uh, the only thing I want to mention is that uh, we also have these bacteria going, have bacteria going into leaf cells and and bracts of inflorescences and around fruits, for example. They will actually go into, oftentimes into trichomes. And so you can see them uh, in the trichomes. And this, this is an image actually of a, actually of soybean, the image to oh, the left. Yeah, and they have these trichomes on the soybean that, I mean, if you notice, uh, they actually are loaded with bacteria. And this is this one, the image to the left is stained for nitrate. And so you can see the bacteria in those trichomes and you can see the nitrate, the purple staining, which is nitrate around those. So, so even legumes that have nodules also have this other system in their tissues, in their cells, in their hairs, particularly in the root hairs, but also in the leaf hairs. And so you have all over plants, you have this happening. And uh, another plant that does it, you know, since we have a cannabis man here, <laughs> uh, and uh, Bill, wasn't you the one, or Josh, who, who, was the, who was the cannabis person? Was that Bill? Riddle, Bill Riddle still here? Unmute your microphone, Josh. That would be Josh. Josh. That's the cannabis yeah. guy. Cannabis guy, Josh. So, yeah. Josh, okay, so so we have a student working on that and uh, looking at these trichomes, and this April Meat Chief that's doing that. She's trying to finish up now. Hey, Josh, so, um, unmute unmute the ZenCaster mic, not the Zoom. So okay, so this actually shows the trichome of hemp of cannabis, and you can see they're on these little stalks, and you can see the heads. The heads are where the chemicals are, but also where the bacteria are. The stalks actually have, you see they're slightly green, they have chlorophyll in them, they have chloroplasts, so they're producing sugars. We think that those sugars produced in those stalks and the chloroplasts in the stalks are actually transported into the heads to provide the sugar to drive nitrogen fixation inside those cannabis heads, those trichomes. So this actually shows a image, microscopic slide of one of those cannabis hemp heads and you can see the arrows here, but you can see bacteria there. This is stained for superoxide. So you have the superoxide interactions happening. The plant, the bacteria are there. This is early in trichome development and glandular trichome development. Bacteria there, uh, the plant is already secreting superoxide onto those microbes. And that will cause the microbes to lose their cell walls and will also cause them to start secreting nitrogen, uh, nitric oxide and maybe other forms of nitrogen. We don't know all of it, but this is older in development. You can see the cells now. This is that head again. You can see the cells, trichome cells, these bigger cells in the center. There's eight of those that are actual trichome plant cells. And then you can see this mantle, this around it, this kind of brownish area that, that goes around it made of little dots. Those are the bacteria. Those are all those little bacterial protoplast wall list, their wall list where the bacteria, the walls have been removed from those bacteria. And then you can see the inner interface between the plant and the bacterial layer there. And then you can see it's kind of blue. And this is actually stained for superoxide. So you can see the plant secreting superoxide onto those microbes, 
causing nutrient extraction, nitrogen extraction from those microbes. So trichomes are actually appear to be adaptations that plants have developed uh, for getting nitrogen from bacteria. So, and this is all happening in, in leaves and developing parts of plants. So this is another place where plants are getting their nutrients. Hence, uh, this is another place where you could provide micronutrients and facilitate this whole nitrogen fixation process and nutrient transfer that can go also into the, into the plant. So this is why foliar fertilization actually works. And we think that the chemicals in a lot of these glandular trichomes are actually um, oxygen scavenging chemicals. They're, they're mostly, if you look into the literature on a lot of, for example, cannabinoids and a lot of uh, terpenoids produced in glandular trichomes, uh, they are, are antioxidants. They have antioxidant properties. We think that plants are making those, putting those around the bacteria in order to reduce uh, oxygen, molecular oxygen uh, from the air, essentially uh, scavenging the oxygen from the air. Uh, and that's important around the microbes. And that's important for nitrogen fixation by the microbes because oxygen uh, suppresses nitrogen fixation. So if the plant can limit the amount of O2 that's produced coming from the air, uh, around those microbes, it can increase the efficiency of nitrogen fixation by the microbes. So we think the chemicals may be a way that plants are manipul another way that plants are manipulating microbes, in this case, nitrogen fixing microbes, in order to maximize the amount of nitrogen that they're producing. So that's all the cannabis chemicals. So there, there may be another function. No, besides, you know, people also think they could be like anti-insect or just make people high or something like that. But maybe the primary function could be that they have to do with these microbes in reducing oxygen around these microbes. They could be antioxidants, really. Hops, same way. This is my student, April Michi, again. She's working on hops, hops. You look at the hops cones, you see the same thing. Glandular trichomes, you see bacteria in it. And there's a hops Stain for nitrate, hops, you can see the glandular trichome there on the, on the leaf. And you can see it's stained purple uh, uh, for nitrate. That's the diphenylamine that we use. But you see the cells around it are not staining. Uh, they're not producing that nitrate. Only where those microbes are inside those glandular trichomes. So glandular trichomes, we think, are actually many nitrogen-fixing organs on leaves of plants, uh, compared to, they're not as efficient. Obviously, they're not as efficient as rhizobia, these big structures on roots that, that are limited legumes, but they're another avenue where plants are using to produce nitrogen from these microbes. And uh, anyways, that's, these are all the people that did it, and I'm glad you uh, were able to uh, listen to everything. And, oh, we are uh, so fortunate to have you join us, and I'm glad we were able to, I'm going to use a bad pun, and on a high note. And on a high note. <laughs> that's that's cannabis and the hops. <laughs> on, a, on a high note, that is. Yeah. Uh, it's not a bad pun. No, it's, it's uh, a good yeah. I like that one. I like that pun. Okay, yeah. Well, we are very fortunate to have you join us today. I, we, could, I, we could go on and on. I'm sure you have much more knowledge that you can share with us, and we would love to continue this. And maybe we can have you back sometime because you're, you're continuing to do research. You explained that one of your graduate students is doing some work on aeroponics and hydroponics. Um, so we would certainly invite you to come back. And, you know, for those that are interested, you're doing good work. You're one of many that are really trying to help push regenerative ag, the importance of, of microbes. Uh, you're leading in many ways on those fronts. Uh, how can people follow you? Are you on LinkedIn or how do they, how do people learn? I am. Where you're I doing am. Web? I you am are? on LinkedIn. And okay. LinkedIn is a good way to do it. LinkedIn okay, is a good way wonderful. to do it. ResearchGate, I do that. I I gave up uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, during the pandemic, you know, and the, during it was just not not yeah. very good. The Understandably, poli political so. stuff. I didn't like all the political stuff that was. Yep. Happening, you know, I think. Yep. I think a lot of people yeah. share the same sentiment, myself included. Yes. 
Well, good. Yes. And and for those that don't know, ResearchGate is, that's open to anyone, right? Anybody can go to ResearchGate. It's kind of an open source area I where think people you can... have to, you have yeah. to say, yeah, you have to say you're an independent researcher. Because it's supposed to be for researchers. So you define yourself as an independent researcher. And uh, most people, most people can define themselves that way. And it gives you access to a lot of research that people are doing. In fact, most, most scientists are on ResearchGate. Not everybody, but most scientists are on ResearchGate. And so you can get there, you can, you can get access, you can find when they, you know, you can follow people just like LinkedIn, you follow yeah. people. And when they post something, you can then get it or you could send them requests for papers and stuff it's a really a it's really a good way to to get access to research these days especially if you yes, don't have a library is. if you don't have right. a library they'll send you you can just send someone an email and yeah. or or just give them a little message in researchgate and they'll give you the paper or if they can't then they'll tell you but mostly they can give you the paper wonderful Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I uh, certainly hope the video works out because those are some fascinating images. Um, if not, then, hey, you're just going to have to reach out to Dr. White and find out when he's doing another webinar and, and see it because it's, it's, it is really fascinating. So I applaud you and all the other researchers that are focusing on this area. I think this has tremendous potential and is going to help contribute to moving ag in the right direction because it has real world, real world implications. Yeah, great. So the, I just stopped the video and it's, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be sent to me in a, in a, a few minutes and then I'll f try to forward it to you guys. Yeah. We'll get you in touch with Zach and put you two together and we'll get that going and wonderful. Well, I think on that note, we will, we will conclude this episode. Dr. White, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. I enjoyed it. You'll have a good afternoon. You too. Bye-bye.